Just a second, it's almost uploading now. I've seen one guy once in a conference not switching off while uploading his slides um, in front of about 100 attendants. And when you upload it from your G Drive on, in Google, it first takes you to your Gmail account so everybody can see what's your new email. And he had a new email and it's in bold so everybody saw the topic was where is child maintenance for this month with three huge question marks and three huge exclamation marks that undermined the credibility of the whole presentation that followed. <laughs> I mean, with, sorry? No, it was about private international law a few years ago and uh, And, uh, well, basically all the, all the lady attendants were saying, well, this man doesn't pay child maintenance to, um, to his ex-wife, don't listen to him. And all the male attendants saying, well, if you don't pay, chi pay child maintenance, at least don't let everybody know about that in the room. And he didn't even stay for the coffee break. Okay. Um, I already reported this to. No, it's eco blank, but uh, but. Thanks, um, Carlos. Thanks so much in the beginning mentioning you know the the, the sequence of, of issues in connection with jurisdiction and uh, and applicable law. Um, this is not the remote for the slides. Did you? Yeah, all right, it's here, okay. Basically, to put it into wider context and why you made the remark that there is a sequence of issues to, uh, to, to discuss, uh, the primary questions are procedural in, in sequence, right, as, as, as they come. That's um, jurisdiction, recognition, and enforcement, and we all know very well the, the major legal sources from the Brussels Convention on Jurisdiction and Recognition and Enforcement in Civil and uh, and commercial matters until the most recent Brussels one recast um, regulation where the rules of jurisdiction give more protection to a so-called weaker party, not only in consumer contracts, there's a list of contracts which are typical for adhesion that one party has only one choice to either adopt to it or, 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 or take it or leave it. Insurance, consumer and individual employment contracts. Obviously, the purpose here is not to bind the consumer into litigation in a country other than that of his own domicile, because the legal risks are much higher. It's an unknown legal system. If it's not your own legal system, um, the costs are higher, the language is unknown, et cetera, et cetera. Whether the consumer is plaintiff or defendant is the same problems. So the rules of jurisdiction should be favorable to the consumer not to bind him into litigating abroad. The structure of rules on consumer jurisdiction in all these conventions and regulations. First, there is a rule about the scope of application. What do you mean by a consumer and what do you mean by consumer contracts? In the Brussels 1 regulation, this was Article 15. In the Brussels 1 recast, this is Article 17. If that step is passed, so you actually looked at uh, whether or not this is a consumer case, then you have the objective causes of jurisdiction, not to lead the consumer out of, its, out of the jurisdiction of its own domicile. Um, and then the rule is phrased in a way that first it takes um, the case when the consumer is a plaintiff, and then what is the cause of jurisdiction if the consumer is being sued. Um, these are Article 16 and Article 18. 16 in the old version of Brussels 1 and 18 in the, in, in the last version. And then the third rule is about a jurisdiction agreement, just in case there is an agreement between the parties about jurisdiction, so it's not an objective cause of jurisdiction, then compared to a jurisdictional agreement or prorogation of jurisdiction in commercial cases where there is an assumed equal negotiating power for the parties uh, in consumer contracts, that is limited. Uh, the choices of the legal systems between the, which the parties can choose is actually very much limited. Whereas in normal commercial cases, for example, it's frequent use that parties choose the jurisdiction of a third neutral country, that would be disastrous to a consumer because that would then again lead him outside of his own jurisdiction. And these are these three rules. We have two more rules than in Rome. One, there was just one article here, it's three articles, but it's still only a thin layer of, uh, of, of Brussels one. 
Then recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments if the losing party is domiciled in a country other than the country of the forum, then will that, uh, will that judgment be recognized and enforced? Um, the question is, is there anything specific in connection with consumer contracts for recognition and enforcement? Firstly, all these matters about recognizing and enforcing uh, judgments in consumer disputes fall under the general scheme of recognition and enforcement, for example, the grounds of refusal or the general grounds of refusal uh, for recognition and enforcement apply. Public policy, ex parte procedures, res judicata, etc. But there is one very specific consumer, consumer specific ground for refusal. That's the breach of the consumer jurisdictional rules against the consumer. It's not, it's not common practice that if a court proceeded without jurisdiction in any case, then that would be an obstacle to recognize and enforce a judgment, but if it is a consumer-specific case in which the consumer was a defendant, then yes, this is a ground uh, to refuse recognition of uh, a foreign judgment. These are the primary issues, jurisdiction and recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments. Then we have a number of ancillary issues uh, for procedure. The sources are same as here. And then miscellaneous other ones. It's similar to, to your list of, uh, of, of directives and secondary legal sources with conflict of laws. The same happens to procedural <coughs> provisions. For example, a provision pops up in the, same, in the small claims procedure regulation, another one in connection with choice of jurisdiction from the unfair contract terms directive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are not, not primary issues, but they might be important in a given case. Now, once we sorted out the jurisdiction, then we sorted out whether or not uh, the judgment can, either in a real case or just hypothetically, uh, be recognized and enforced against the defendant. Then we come to the conflict of laws aspect. This, is, this takes us back to uh, the previous presentation by Professor Lorente, primarily Rome 1, and then some specific ancillary issues, either in the list of legal sources that you mentioned. I also included Rome 2 for culpa and contra handle. It's, it's so specific and so exceptional, but still, in principle, it could come up. And then the connection between these different sources is that the applicable substantive law is determined by the connecting factor of the forum. So first you have to see the jurisdiction, which country has jurisdiction over a consumer dispute, then see the connecting factor of that country, and then that will take us to consumer protection law, actually. That's the third step, substantive law in the end. And obviously, the, the vehicle for, uh, for um, harmonization on the European level is to eliminate the, the option of forum shopping, whereas competing jurisdictions would you know, uh, have different con connecting factors. Now, I focus only, from now on, I focus only on jurisdiction, right? This was the general scheme of how this issue is placed within private international law. I now choose only jurisdiction under the Brussels I regime. By the antecedents, I mean the Brussels Convention, the Lugano Convention, the and then we go to Brussels I, and in the end, the Brussels I recast. Firstly, there are very, some general or preliminary matters to put consumer jurisdiction rules in context. These are not specifically in connection with consumer protection, but if you, are, if you don't see the, the wider context, you will never get to those three articles that actually deal with consumer protection. For example, scope, right? Is the whole case under the scope of Brussels one at all? Then we go to the scope of application of the consumer protective rules. Is the case actually a consumer protection case? Is the case actually a consumer contract? Now, um, we have that one article that defines uh, what is a consumer contract in Brussels 1, and it has to be interpreted. It has to be interpreted by case law. The, <clears throat> the UNALEX system, the case reporting system, which is funded by the European Commission, and I know that not just myself, but some of you are also in connection with the network of case reporting for UNALEX, uh, only for that one specific rule that defines a consumer lists 274 different reported cases which are processed, uh, out of which 17 are from the Court of Justice of the European Union. The remaining 267 uh, are member state cases, and they really go to specific details of how to define a consumer, how to define um, a consumer contract. Once this 
item on the list is ticked, so you know that this is actually a consumer case. Then we have to interpret the objective causes of jurisdiction. For example, how do you determine the domicile of the consumer in connection with the time factor if the consumer moves between contract conclusion and, uh, and uh, the litigation? Then when do you have to look at the domicile of the consumer? Just one specific issue. For the interpretation of the cause of jurisdiction, 80 judgments reported that shape up that shape the ultimate meaning of, of the cause of jurisdiction for consumers, five of which are from the Court of Justice of the European Union. And if there happens to be a jurisdiction agreement, then we still have, at this point in time, we still have 36 reported cases about what a jurisdiction agreement means and how it has to be interpreted, one from uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union. Now, these three seem to be uh, issue number two, three, and four seem to be the most direct consumer-related issues, but it would be too easy to go to these immediately because it's much easier to get lost in the general or preliminary matters if you don't know these ones than to apply the cause of jurisdiction for consumer contracts. Since my time here for the presentation is limited, I had to make a choice of which of these issues to present. I'll, I'll start with this. Right? These are very specific consumer-related ones, which are fairly easy to, uh, to look at, but you will never get to these if you don't sort out the general preliminary matters, which are not consumer-related, um, but they are a necessary first step before establishing uh, consumer jurisdiction. What are these matters? First one is autonomous interpretation. Autonomous interpretation of Brussels one, but not just that. The reach of consistency for autonomous interpretation actually extends to private international law. It means that the meaning of phrases used in the rules should be coherently understood for the purposes of the Brussels Convention, Lugano Convention, Brussels Regulations, Rome Convention, Rome Regulation, and miscellaneous other instruments in private international law. This means that all the, the, the phrases used from consumer, contract, etc., etc., have their specific meaning, which fall under private international law. This may be completely different from what it is understood for the same phrases in national law, or what these phrases mean in other instruments, particularly substantive law instruments of consumer protection uh, of the European Union. Let me give you a few examples. How do you define a consumer? We have a fairly easy rule under Article 15, Brussels 1, and the understanding of a consumer should be the same under Brussels 1 as it is under Rome 1, uh, as it is under the different uh, uh, conventions. Uh, I'm glad that you refer to what happens if there's a dual purpose. That definition applies to private international law. It may be completely different in, in, in domestic settings. For example, uh, the rule that um, if the professional use of the, of the good in a consumer contract is manifestly marginal, it still remains to be a consumer contract. That is the understanding of a consumer contract for European private international law. But the line may be drawn somewhere else. The cases are sometimes meticulously uh, detailed. I took the example of clothing for your workplace purposes. Right? We all wear nice suits and nice dresses because this is what is expected in higher education. So when you buy yourself a tie or a suit, because you have to lecture at the university, is it a private purpose or is it a professional purpose? Because the reason that you do this is actually because you have to lecture as a university lecturer. The same for lawyers who have to appear in court. Uh, but you can use these clothes for going out for a beer or just walking in town, so for other purposes as well. Whereas if we were not lawyers here, but we were working in the field of biochemistry, then our workplace clothing would most probably consist of a long white veil, a mask so that the different bacteria we experiment we don't get in, in us, thick glasses, and probably a hat. Where is the difference for purchasing any of these clothes, clothes for our uh, workplace purposes? If there is something wrong with the clothing and you take it back, are you entitled to the consumer guarantees because you bought as a consumer or you bought as an employee and it is needed? Uh, the answer given in uh, case law is actually whether or not you are, does anybody know? You probably know, but anybody else? Whether or not you are remunerated by your employer. 
So if you buy your workplace co clothing for yourself, for the purpose of your job, and you get paid, you get reimbursed by your employer, then it's not a private purpose anymore. But the judges had to find it out because there was no indication to this effect uh, in, in the language of the law itself. Sometimes very basic civil law contracts have to be reconstructed for the purposes of, of uh, autonomous interpretation. Let me take you to one of the most basic concepts in civil law, contract. Consumer protection relates to contracts, so it must be a contractual relationship. And for the purposes of, of Brussels 1 and Rome 1, the phrase contract had to be built up from the beginning. Otherwise, if we resort to the phrase contract in national civil laws, that might in a given case result in as many possible outcomes as you can guess. The most generally known uh, example is whether or not a gift is a, is, is a contract. In some countries it's a contract, in other countries it's not. But for example, in connection with consumer protection, there's a long list of cases in connection with prize notification. Somebody with too much time sitting at home flipping through all the pages of these mail order companies decides to order a nice set of cutlery because it says that if you order this, then you may be entitled to win 1 million euros. The person doesn't win the 1 million euros, so starts a procedure. Is the prize notification part of the contract or not? And then court, court, courts had to go through that, you know, step by step. Ultimately now, the autonomous interpretation is that if the order was made and the contract was concluded, then prize notification is a contractual matter. Whereas if only the claim for price notification was sent by the consumer, but the order was not made at the same time for the cutlery, for example, then there is no contract. So then it's not a consumer dispute. But all these elements had to be built up from zero for the purposes of autonomous interpretation of a legal phrase uh, under pr European private international law. Scope of the regulation, internationality or foreign element. It is a requirement. Everything that European Union uh, private international law built up applies only if there is a foreign element. It's important because if the case is purely domestic, then you cannot rely on the causes of jurisdiction of Brussels 1. Originally, the, uh, Brussels 1 would regulate only international jurisdictions, so it would indicate only the member state. But exceptionally, for example, for consumer contracts, it also gives a territorial cause of jurisdiction. It doesn't indicate only the member state, but it also indicates the exact court within a country by saying that it's not the domicile uh, of the consumer that designates the member state, but the domicile of the consumer actually designates the court itself. Now, this cause of jurisdiction may be not non-existent in many member states. I know, for example, from my great colleague uh, uh, Alek Galic that it's not existent in, Slov in Slovenian procedural law, and neither is it existent in, in a number of other smaller uh, EU member states procedural laws, because really you don't have to travel so much, so if you have to just go to a court two towns away and then it's the border of the country, then, then the territorial jurisdiction is not so important for a consumer, because you can bridge the distance. Whereas in a bigger member states, it matters whether or not uh, it is your domicile where you can be sued or you can sue as a consumer or you should travel 200 kilometers to another uh, town within the same country. <coughs> that extra protection that is granted by territorial jurisdiction doesn't apply if the case is pure domestic, right? You cannot extend the jurisdictional protection of a consumer to purely domestic cases. <coughs> Also, autonomous interpretation doesn't apply if the case is pure domestic. So then, member state courts have to build up step by step again, for example, if a prize notification, a promise of a prize notification is a contract or not, or whether or not your clothing for your workplace purposes is a consumer contract or not. <coughs> the regulation actually provides the specific internationality element. It applies if the defendant is domiciled in a member state. And then it extends this that in, if it is the trader, and the trader is not, oops, sorry, no, is not domiciled in a member state, but it has a branch agency or other establishment within a member state, then uh, the jurisdictional rules of Brussels won't still apply. So we can catch 
as plaintiff consumers. It's only if the consumer is a plaintiff we can catch the foreign traders, even if they are not domiciled within the EU, but they conduct business, for example, from China or the US or wherever else. If they have a branch agency or other est establishment, how do we know if they have a branch agency or other establishment? We go to the autonomous interpretation of the phrase branch agency and other establishment hundreds of cases that shape the content of these legal phrases. <clears throat> if the defendant or his uh, branch is not domiciled in the EU, then we're back to national procedural law. And this is when you open your own act on procedure, civil procedure, and then that will tell you uh, where to sue or where to be sued, even if it's a consumer case. <coughs> scope of the reg regulation, material scope, this is, this is a jungle of different cases, which even in a consumer case you cannot escape addressing. First, it has to be a civil and commercial matter. It means that the regulation equally applicable to Rome 1 and uh, applicable to all other private international law sources exclude those contracts which are in connection with revenue, customs and administrative matters, and which are in connection with the acta jura imperii, that is to say when um, when, when it's in connection with the uh, um, state uh, public uh, functions. I will just very briefly flip through a few, ex a a few examples. Fee for services in public administration. Even if in a country it is a, based on a contract, it's not uh, under the scope of Brussels 1, so your country's law will deter determine if it is a consumer matter or not. Payment that can be collected as tax even if the, the payment is for a service from public administration for your private purposes, whether or not it's a consumer contract depends on national law. Remuneration for legal aid and legal representation of defendants in, in criminal procedure. If it's a consumer issue or not, depends on national law, not on the regulation. A fee for prison services, which is, it looks like a hotel bill, but it's not because it's not really voluntary, but still you get, you know, accommodation and, 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 and food, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not under the scope. And then, and this is where I will stop, right? Uh, remuneration for state services, which are le self, less self-evident. Hospital bill outside of Social Security. Case law says it's actually acta jura imperi. Even if you as a foreign patient are billed by the hospital to, to be treated, it's, uh, it's not under uh, the, the regulation. Tuition in state school, considered to be public law. Horse race gambling in a country, this was a French case where the organization of gambling is state monopoly. It's not considered to be a civil and commercial matter, hence we don't get to the rules of, of, of consumer protection within uh, the rules of jurisdiction. It depends on national law then. Pub use of public utilities. Typically we think it's, it's, it's consumer protection, it's a consumer contract, but it's not under the scope, so you cannot really apply um, the rules of jurisdiction. Counter example, Penalty payment, a civil remedy, for example, to breach an injunction, whether it's against um, a consumer or by a consumer against a trader, in case though this is considered to be a civil and commercial matter, even if the nature is, is, is criminal. I'm sorry, I need to stop here now. Uh, I would have flipped through the excluded areas and the relationship to other cause of jurisdiction and other parts of the regulation. The rules on consumer jurisdictions are exclusive except the exceptions are jurisdiction and insurance, which is lex specialis, and real estate, which is also lex specialis compared to, um, to consumer jurisdiction. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I need to stop here now, and I have to give the floor to others. Um, thank you very much. We can continue discussion afterwards.